My name is Anissa White. I'm Cree Métis with roots in northeastern Alberta at St. Paul de Métis Settlement and Whitefish Lake or Goodfish Lake First Nation. And my traditional names are Tlikuthaksa from my Nuchanath family and Manat from my Kosalish family. Hi, hi. What does Indigenous law mean to you? So Indigenous laws to me are a coherent body of laws that address all aspects of human life, of human interaction, um, and also it speaks to the protocols and obligations that we have one to another, people to people, as well as, well as people to the land and to animals and to the resources. And it also addresses the, the, the possibility of conflicts and really safeguarding relationships between families and nation to nation as well. So Indigenous laws are a crucial part of my work. I work in the Canadian criminal justice system and I prepare what's called GLADU reports. GLADU reports, since 1999, they're a type of pre-sentence report that really goes much further in creating a restorative justice plan and, and creates healing principles for that offender when they're going to be in front of the judge, whether they've pled guilty or they've been found guilty. And what the Supreme Court has said is that all judges in Canada have a duty to take into consideration what is a fit sentence for an Aboriginal person. Knowing that we come from such a difficult history of residential schools, of colonization, of post-contact trauma, the way that that ricochets down family systems really creates such chaos often in the lives of individuals, such that I get the chance to say, here's the whole story, here's the whole individual, past, present and future. This is what they've experienced. These are the different factors that have come to bear on their family or their nation. And I turn to Indigenous law to help me create the restorative justice plan for that judge to take into consideration. Now it's not a sentencing discounting report. Um, what it is, is creating a pathway for that judge to be able to say that specific to this for individual, their Aboriginal nation, whether they're Métis, Inuit or First Nation, they have an existing uh, body of knowledge of legal principles that have already been at play and have been working very effectively. What can be brought into the court so that that judge is making a decision that's fit for that Aboriginal offender? So in order to access that information, I have to be really creative and really direct. So I rely on knowledge keepers, knowledge carriers, elders, and hereditary leaders. I have to find them and speak to them and ask them, what were the underlying principles within your community to deal with this kind of harm done? And how would that look like today? So I reach out to knowledge keepers, uh, elders, hereditary leaders, to ask them what are the underlying principles here that need to be taken to, into consideration that a Canadian judge can take, look at and make sense of to find an alternative to prison time. Because what we're trying to look at is to use the Indigenous law, that whole piece about restoring relationships, about creating accountability, but also about creating restitution and and creating peace back in that community when, once that individual returns. We need to do the work there. I need the Indigenous legal traditions and the laws to be able to spell out a bit of a plan. So for example, where you have an individual who has created, who has caused harm um, to, for example, a break and enter, what, we, what I tend to do is to look at the underlying aspect of that offence cycle. So if there is an issue of substance abuse that has interfered with that person's life, oftentimes we need to get to the core of that part. However, once we address the trauma, we usually do find that there's a bit of a pathway that we can use. So for instance, some elders have said to me, it's very clear how we see the world when it comes to injustice. That individual has to, number one, take, this is just for, for example, a Nuchanath case that I recently dealt with. We have to take into consideration the fact that there's been harm done, that there needs to be a bit of a plan to restore that person's loss, their property loss, and there needs to be some continuous demonstration that that person has learned their lesson and is also becoming a better person from it. So we see a difference from the Canadian legal system as being purely punitive, um, creating more of a healing-based strategy to addressing, um, to addressing crime. And what that also means is that we're restoring those relationships. So I've seen individuals say to me, you need to ask this individual to cut wood for two years and supply it to all the elders every year when it comes time to need wood. 
when it's going to be the winter season. I've also see, uh, heard a knowledge keeper say to me, you need to make sure that this person is consistently fishing for our families, especially the ones that are in need, because they're the ones that are most likely to require the food and sustenance to take them through winter. So this is the person who needs to take, into, take, take, take on board that he has really created some harm in the lives of individuals. And this is a way to, I guess, restore right relationships and create, reset the balance within that community so that we can still embrace him at our potlatches and at our feasts and we don't ostracize him in a manner that would hurt him and his family and his children. So Indigenous law is such a crucial part of me not only creating something that would be helpful for the judge to make their job easier, but it also helps that individual when they get that report and they can see that these are the principles that their nation lives by or their specific family group or their specific head of house or their specific um, chiefs have said to me, that really matters in helping them heal too. So it's a big part of my work. So the Gladue reports are a, pre a type of a pre-sentence report and, but they, are, they also apply to bail hearings um, and to parole hearings as well. And what they are is simply about a 10 to 15 page report that sets out the whole story for that individual and it applies in every courtroom across Canada, um, whether it's local courts or as you move through the, uh, through the tiers of courts, it can also apply higher as well. We have to set out the various Gladue factors and there's about 12 of them. And they can be anything from uh, having gone to residential school, having gone through foster care, having a history of FASD, having any kind of the, the impacts of, of, of colonization on that particular individual and family and community, I have to present that whole picture to the judge so that they make a fit sentence knowing that there's been all these interruptions and all these pressures that have come to bear on that individual and that really could have directly um, had, a, had a part in them committing that offense and that crime. The implementation of the Gladue decision, the implementation of the, the promise of Gladue is so imperative for us to create new relationships between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people. Um, we also want to restore our families and our individuals to be back at a state of health and of wellness and to really thrive. So I see that the role of Indigenous law actually helps, um, helps us really find a way out of this mess and in many ways it helps put the pieces back together for that individual, that family and that nation. And if you think of three concentric circles, there's the individual and the family and the community. And so at all times Indigenous law can be the path to finding healing throughout those rings of those circles. So it's really powerful to me and I've seen the effects of it. I've also been uh, present when I've heard Native court workers who are such an, a, a crucial, play such a crucial role in this area of bringing Indigenous law into courtrooms across Canada and I've heard of, of Native court workers who say who have the opportunity to really speak on behalf of an individual who's accused. So recently I heard of a situation where there was a young mom who was charged uh, for um, uh, clam digging out of season. Now when this Native court worker spoke to her and said what was the reason for you doing your clam digging out of season? Can you afford this thousands and thousands of dollars fine and she said no of course not and she said I was just trying to feed my family because there was a school excursion and I was trying to give my children some food to take on their lunch so what she came into the judge was she came with a new kind of a, a bit of a plan and she said how about this individual come and work at the food bank for a period of weeks or months and learn how to actually package together food, uh, food baskets for families in need. Because number one, she'll be really dealing with a lot of that. That to me, that to her is, might, might be the punitive side of it and in being having some kind of a punishment or a consequence for clam digging out of season. Um, but also it teaches her that this is where the food bank is. And if you ever need food in the future, this is where you may come and, and actually access and take up the resource too. So we don't always have to see Indigenous law in a very, um, in, in a manner that's extremely intricate. We can also see Indigenous law as being taking the best part of Indigenous law, which is looking at restorative justice. And if that's what we can take into courtrooms and offer that to judges and say this is another way of dealing with the situation, knowing that this individual is impoverished and living on a reserve, then let's do that. And so I think we all have a responsibilities, responsibility of, as, as someone who works in the legal system to really make make the most of the knowledge keepers that are around you so that you're constantly moving in step with the principles that are around you instead of simply just defaulting to the criminal code. 
I've heard a lot of people say to me once they hear what the restorative justice principles are of a First Nation, I've heard a lot of non-Indigenous people say to me, that's exactly what my cousin needed. They needed a, a plan to help them get back on their feet. So I think when people see the value, the, the, the innate value of Indigenous law to really creating plans for all people who come into contact with the criminal justice system, and I'm speaking specifically to rituals such as the sweat lodge, I'm speaking specifically to things such as the bathing and the dips and the, the cleansing rituals that occur um, here on the West Coast, and I'm thinking specifically also about the way in which elders and uh, individuals who are charged with the duty to care for other, more younger, so let's say youth, um, as they grow older, I think those kinds of relational elements um, that exist within communities are just absolutely missing from the wider, in the wider community. And so I think that there's a lot of value and a lot of interest in really reviving Indigenous laws so that they can become a teaching tool for other individuals who are moving through that criminal justice system or moving through the, their addictions, sobriety journey, and so on. I think that Indigenous law isn't good for just Indigenous people. I think it's been very helpful and very healing for other people who are experiencing challenges and hardship in their own lives as well. Can you speak to some of the history of the Gladue decision? So in 1999, when the Supreme Court of Canada handed down their decision in the Gladue decision, the reason why it was such an important uh, landmark decision for all Canadians and all Indigenous people is because simply that there was a recognition of overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in prisons across the country. And what they also said was that this is not obviously an effective way to address the systemic factors and background factors that Aboriginal people almost 99% of the time carry with them when they enter a courtroom. So specifically, we know that Aboriginal people face Unfathomable, unfathomable prejudice and discrimination once they're institutionalized within Canadian jails. And we know that that's not that di uh, dissimilar to the discrimination that their ancestors or them themselves would have experienced when they went through residential schools or as day students or as boarders or in, in the numerous other policies in Canadian history um, to the present day that really impact the way in which Aboriginal people are perceived and the way in which they interface with Canadians generally. So this particular case was so powerful because it created an opportunity to do something different and to think outside the box and to really come at the, come at the issue from a different way. So the federal parliament implemented this through the Canadian Criminal Code and the section that is specific to this is section 718.2e and that specifically asks us, asks judges to apply the background factors and apply the, the knowledge that they have around how Aboriginal people have moved through history and how the, the, the fifth sentence that's required takes incredible efforts on the part of judges. So the way in which Indigenous law has the most efficacy and the most um, power right now is to really fill that space and to say here is the way in which we would address this particular harm done in our community from this particular individuals, indigenous background. So I'm not looking for generic principles of pan-aboriginalism. What I'm looking specifically is what are those restorative justice considerations for that particular individual from their hereditary chiefs if they have them, their knowledge keepers and their um, people that hold that information about law. I'm looking for those principles to bring forward in front of a judge. And I even go further and I create all other options and alternatives to jail time. And in doing so, I have to hit the notes of what those legal principles are from that Indigenous legal system. So sometimes it's a very challenging piece of work because I go at it with a really strong methodology, but sometimes there are individuals who are ready to have that conversation. And it is a difficult conversation when there has been legitimate harm done in the community by an individual, irrespective of the background or the reasons why the underlying aspect of that offense cycle, there are hurt people within that community. So it's difficult to encapsulate a proper process when the process is happening on phones and interviews and face to face time for me, and then to then encapsulate that into a final report. So what I would like to see as a Gladue writer, and I think most Gladue writers I've spoken to across BC have said, is that they would like to see much more um, preparedness and readiness on the part of 
individual nations when it comes to having discussions and, top, and, and, and talks about Indigenous legal traditions, such that when an individual comes to us and we get their name, we get their intake form, we get their, the, the type of uh, crime that they've been charged with. Um, so what would be very helpful for me as a Gladue writer is to be able to come to First Nations, Inuit and Métis groups who have much more preparedness and receptiveness to have those difficult conversations and to really share that knowledge with the, the community and with me and with the world in a manner that truly does create um, real coherence into what those restorative justice principles could look like. So we know that not all legal traditions of the past can easily be translated into the present day. And that's where the bulk of the work has to take place. So we really have to pull up our, our sleeves and say, master students, undergrad students, youth, um, elders, let's get together and create con more information so that the world has that at their fingertips. So when I come to do my work and I have eight weeks that I'm not stepping into a community and trying to do all this work on the side of my desk. It's really helpful to be able to have that information accessible and also for people to feel safe enough to share that sacred information with me. And I take that to be a great honor and a responsibility. So I suppose on our side too, as legal workers, Aboriginal workers, we have to have far more integrity and far more cultural competency so that we can receive that information and translate it in a manner that a judge will easily access and run with. It's, it's absolutely human nature to, be, to find it difficult to separate the behavior from the individual. Um, of course, as a legal worker, I'm able to really look at the underlying aspect of that offense cycle, so I don't get so immersed in that element of, of personalizing the harm done because it's not happening to me. So that puts me in a good position to be able to ask appreciative inquiry questions from that community. However, if there is still uh, unresolved business within that community, if there have not been proper uh, protocols implemented in the right window of time, I find it, I have found it very difficult for people to be willing to speak. And oftentimes the fear is twofold. The first level is that they're, they're fearful that anything that they say will um, result in a discounted sentence. So that tells me that on that person's continuum that they're quite um, unhappy and, and upset and rattled and, and so they should be by a particular incident that has occurred. On the other hand, I also hear from some individuals that the sacred information and the principles that they want to share with me are owned by particular families and heads of families or um, particular individuals and they don't, they don't have the, the discretion or the, the rights and prerogatives to share and transmit that information to somebody in my role. And it could be that because I'm a legal worker, I'm still connected to the, the provincial system, understandably. Um, but more often than not, I do find that the individuals can find the whole topic of dealing with harm and restoring relationships to be far too difficult to do um, with somebody who's an outsider. And so I really would hope that perhaps in the future, there's a way to normalize these conversations and to have really robust and really thorough and, and fulfilling discourse within nations and within communities such that they're ready and willing to come into a judge, judge's courtroom and say, I'm an elder of this nation and this is how we deal with this kind of harm done and this is what I want you to consider when you're making your decision as a judge. Because judges have to apply, they have to look at the topic of being morally culpable. So we want to look at that definition of morality and ensure that it's embedded within the nation of that individual as well. We don't want to just apply yet another generic definition of justice. We want to really be very careful and cautious to ground all of our recommendations and options we put in, our, in my Gladue reports in a way that the underlying principles of those justice systems are indigenous in every way. What are you excited about with this work? Well, one of my favorite parts of this work uh, as a legal worker, as a Gladue writer, is when I go into jails within BC 
and I know that a little bit of the language or the, the terms or the words of that individual's language, I try to use them in the, in the jail itself so that that person has a sense of comfort and connection to their home community and to their people and also to their selfhood because that's really compromised when you are incarcerated and we know that from all the, the research and the writing around the effect on the, the mental health of an individual. So I'm really excited when I get to use some of the, my introduction words to individuals. It makes me happy and I see their face light up and sometimes I hear their dialect and sometimes I can tell where they're from even without asking the question, sometimes. Another thing that I'm really excited about too is when I get a file in front, put in front of me or emailed to me and I look at the nature of the charges, sometimes it's really interesting for me to be able to find out from that person when I have their, that interview, who are the people that influenced you? Who are the people that created that idea of how you connect to your indigeneity. So oftentimes I've heard elders over and over again are referred to. And sometimes those elders are still living, so I have the privilege of contacting them. And I get to really hear from that elder's point of view how they were teaching their laws and language and cultural practices, whether it was berry picking or mushroom picking or telling jokes in their own language. I get to hear that firsthand from the elder. And I get to sometimes relay that back to the offender who's sitting in jail. And the dignity and the beauty that I see within themselves emanate is, so, is such a privilege because now I'm offering a picture of themselves through the eyes of someone who says, you belong to me, you belong to us, you're one of us. That disconnection is a huge part of the tragedy that is the, the world that we live in where our people are disconnected one to another and from our lands and from our territories. So I have a little bit of a place in creating that reconnection and it means a lot to me but I couldn't do it unless that individual was open and willing to talk about their Indigenous laws and practices. So it's a real vehicle. Indigenous law is a real vehicle for me to connect offenders back to their home communities. And when they come out of jail um, they get that report and they sometimes say later they feel really good about what that report says because it clearly outlines their nation, their language, their histories, any residential schools that were in their area and they, it also talks about the healing plan that I've created and the restorative justice principles but it's situated within their indigenous worldview and belief systems. So that becomes something that they carry with them throughout their life. And so some of the anecdotal reports of individuals who have been um, put through the criminal justice system and not quite made it into jail because of my Glad You report, but instead opened up this huge journey into their self and to their addressing their own traumas and pain, it's a real privilege and it's something that I don't take lightly and I know that every report that I complete, that is somebody's life and that's a reconnection that's happening on paper but coming to life in a courtroom. Mm -hmm.